Over the past three years or so, consumer prices on both sides of the Atlantic have risen at their most rapid rate in four decades. Why? Professor John H. Cochran joins us today from California to give his answer to that question and others besides. You're very welcome, John, and thanks for giving us your time, particularly so early in the morning. Thanks. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I wish I were with you, but uh, <laughs> that travels hard. Indeed, particularly from so far. So look, after uh, his presentation, John will take questions and comments from you, the aud audience. You can put these via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Before we get going, let me briefly introduce our speaker. The professor is Rosemary and John Anderson, senior, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and a prolific author. His most recent book is The Fiscal Theory of the Price Level. John also contrib contributes regular op-eds to the Wall Street Journal and blogs even more regularly as The Grumpy Economist. He is one of three people who do the Hoover Goodfellows podcast, along with former U.S. National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster and historian Neil Ferguson. Uh, with that, again, you're very welcome, John. Uh, the floor is yours, and we look forward to your presentation and your slides. Thank you. Um, yes, of course, as a recovering business school professor, I can't go far without slides. Um, <laughs> so uh, fiscal theory of the price level. <clears throat> this is uh, the bottom right is the cover of the book, and the bottom left is my other persona as, as blogger and op -editor. Um So let's get right into it. What is the fiscal theory of the price level? Um, you always have to start with an Adam Smith, Smith quote, a prince who should enact that a certain proportion of his taxes be paid in a paper money might give a certain value to this paper money. Uh, and the rest is uh, filling it out, but that of course is not trivial as elsewhere in economics. Uh, ads, there's the book, <clears throat> of course. I would encourage you though to start on my website. There's some uh, introductory essays and uh, mostly what I'll talk about today comes from the uh, introductory essays as opposed to the 600 pages of equations uh, in, in the actual book. Um, so what is fiscal theory? <clears throat> Simple. The price level adjusts so that the real value of nominal government debt equals the present value of primary government surpluses. Uh, <clears throat> I give you an equation in full form or in linearized form. Both are useful uh, ways to think about it. It's just the theory of asset pricing applied to the government, the same way that if you don't think there's enough dividends, stock prices go down. If you don't think the government will repay its debts, you try to get rid of that debt. And the, and the only way to do that is to buy stuff. The price level goes down. Now, this does not mean that debt and deficits automatically mean inflation. It's debt versus the long run ability and will of our governments to repay those and faith in that ability, <clears throat> which can vanish. So not there is no prediction of a mechanical link between debt, deficits, and inflation. The top right graph <clears throat> shows you uh, what is typical and normal fiscal policy. Governments borrow in times of stress, war, pandemic, recession, and then uh, one way or another promise are expected to repay it with a sequence of steady primary surpluses. In that circumstance, there is no change in the present value of total surpluses, the deficit and the following repayment, and there is no inflation. We should expect normal responsible governments to routinely run big deficits and, de and deficits, debt and deficits, and then to pay them off and not to have inflation. Inflation comes when there's a debt or deficit with no faith in its uh, subsequent repayment. And that, of course, the tricky thing is, how do you distinguish those two? Well, that's the tricky thing as it is in stocks. How do you know whether there's a long run uh, dividends to repay a stock? It also means uh, uh, inflation is in the bottom graph can come without any news as debt crises can come without much news when people lose faith in that repayment. Finally, our asset perspective reminds us it's not just surpluses, it's the discount rate. Another way to think of that is interest costs on the debt. And I think of it that way more and more. Interest costs on the debt matter in tandem with primary surpluses in understanding inflation. And that is what may come to bite us uh, soon. Uh, let's just take this out for a ride. <clears throat> now, the simple theory that I showed you here, <clears throat> suppose there's a shock, a big deficit that is not expected to be repaid, the middle thing here, which is I think what happened to us in 2021. <clears throat> The simple theory says, well, the price level jumps overnight. That's not very realistic. So let's be a little more realistic. To do that, I embed fiscal theory in a standard New Keynesian model. The equations are up there just for those of you who like equations to say there are equations here. All I did was added sticky prices to the basic idea. So now what happens? Suppose that the government dumps 5 trillion bucks of money or debt. 
with no plans to repay it. People try to spend that debt, what happens? What happens is rather than the price level jumping, you get a slow period. The price level goes up slowly over time until after two or three years, that debt has been inflated away. Inflation comes out and in the dashed line, inflation measured year over year actually goes up with a sort of a hump shaped response. So inflation comes seemingly out of nowhere. In my simulation, I had the central banks do nothing. Central banks sit there, what happens if you dump a bunch of money on people, a fiscal helicopter drop? Inflation comes seemingly out of nowhere. <clears throat> then uh, inflation gently goes away all on its own without central banks needing to raise interest rates without causing a recession. Uh, you can guess where my interpretation of recent history is going to go. And that's just the smooth version of a one an overnight price level increase, which is what happens in the basic frictionless uh, view here. You know, like a company announces there won't be half as much dividends, boom, stock price goes up. It just happens slowly in our economies because of sticky prices. What about central banks? Central banks still matter in the fiscal theory of the price level. I, maybe I should call it fiscal theory of monetary policy. Here's a slightly expanded model. All I've done here is I've added long-term debt. Uh, and the central bank sets the nominal interest rate. Even in a frictionless world, the nominal interest rate sets the expected rate of inflation. So you know central banks are going to be important. So here's what happened if the central bank raises interest rates. There's the I, standard raising interest rates. But in this simulation, there is no change in fiscal policy. Now I emphasize that almost all models you will run into hide a fiscal contraction along with rising interest rates. At a minimum, when interest rates go up, fiscal policy says, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, and raises uh, taxes to pay the interest costs on the debt. That's fiscal policy as well as monetary policy. Let's ask just what can monetary policy do alone? And here's a simulation. Higher interest rates can lower inflation in the short run at the cost of raising inflation in the long run. Now, this looks very normal. And if you were staring at impulse response functions, you would hardly notice this higher inflation in the long run. But that's in fact what is, central banks are limited. Uh, there's an unpleasant arithmetic. All they can really do is take this to shift inflation over time, but they can do that. And in doing so, they can lower inflation uh, in the short run, which is I think exactly what they did. And indeed, that's good policy. Suppose you're hit by a fiscal shock, top left graph. Suppose the central bank responds, here I had it have a permanent increase in interest rates. It responds to the fiscal shock. That lowers inflation in the short run, though raising it in the long run. The sum of those two things is a very small but very persistent inflation. In standard models, that's much better. In standard models, a small persistent inflation has almost no output effect. So it is a great and good thing for central banks to respond uh, to inflation by raising interest rates and thereby smooth out, but not completely eliminate the inflation. It seems that the Taylor rule is always the answer. It's just the questions keep changing. Now with that background, let's look uh, quickly at what's happening. Uh, why did inflation break out seemingly out of uh, nowhere? Well, says the fiscal theorist, I'm going to use U.S. numbers, uh, but similar things happened in Europe. Uh, the U.S. Uh, added $5 trillion, 30% to the public debt very quickly. $3 trillion of that was immediately monetized and sent checks to people and businesses. That's like a fiscal helicopter drop. That's not quite so easy because you have to convince yourself people did not believe and governments did not promise to repay that debt. And it, uh, so in the essays, I look farther into the history, which we can go into it in more detail if you want to. But yes, I think there's a plausible case that this was, uh, quote, emergency spending and that our governments did not clearly set, actually. Uh, this may have been desirable. They may have wanted a Lucas Stokey state contingent default via inflation, uh, but that the expectations of repayment were not there this time. Uh, I am the luckiest economist in the world because there is where I sent in my uh, uh, my first draft of fiscal theory to the Princeton, Princeton University Press. Uh, and uh, it said, we haven't seen inflation since the Reagan years, but you know maybe someday dust the three copies of this book you'll sell off and it might be useful. Uh, but by the way, don't dump $5 trillion of uh, money on people. And uh, that's exactly what our government did. So hopefully that'll help my book sales a little bit. Second great puzzle, uh, inflation surged. And then just like the model says, then inflation started to ease. <clears throat> with no high interest rates. Here, the, our central banks woke up, but interest rates were below inflation while inflation kept going down. So no high interest rates, no recession, no Phillips curve. Inflation mostly went on its way on its own. 
fact, it came down a little quicker than it might have. The central banks, I think, helped on the margin. Exactly. That's exactly what these uh, uh, simulations say. Inflation would come and go away slowly on its own. Central banks, by, by raising interest rates, could lower inflation now at the cost of making it a little more persistent uh, and bring it down uh, more quickly. Uh, this is a graph from Barrow and Bianchi who look across countries. They look uh, across a range of countries at this amount of government spending relative to the quantity of debt. That turns out to be important. Why? Fiscal theory of the price level. Let me go back here. The amount of uh, inflation that you get, this is dangerous, <laughs> surpluses relative to the initial amount of debt. S over B is what determines the amount of P. So they scaled uh, the uh, COVID spending uh, by the quantity of initial debt outstanding. And look, <laughs> the slope's about a half, suggesting that many country, most countries, uh, you're expected to repay about half of that spending and inflate away the other half. Um, what about supply shocks or relative demand shocks? You've heard a lot of that. Problem with supply shocks is that those are shocks to relative prices. If you can't get TVs through the ports, the price of TVs has to go up relative to wages or services or everything else. And then when that goes away, that price of TVs, the price level will come back, uh, not the inflation rate. To get inflation out of a supply shock, the central bank must accommodate that supply shock. The relative price could happen this way, it could happen by, the, by this way, or it could happen by everything going up, which is what happened. The amount of inflation, price of everything you get out of a supply shock, depends on the extent to which it's accommodated by the central bank. So in a lot of these decompositions, they say supply shock caused inflation, looking at a graph like the middle of the right, but all of those models, if you look deep in them, there's a fiscal and monetary accommodation of the supply shock. The supply shock is basically the carrot uh, in front of the horse, fiscal and monetary policy, which is what pulls the inflation. So I don't really see what the point is of calling that a supply shock. We might as well call it a, a COVID shock or a lab leak shock. Uh, it is the, the horse that, 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 or the donkey in this case that matters. That's what's causing the inflation to come. Um, Let's go back a little more in history. We have just experienced some spectacular experiments that help us to distinguish the great theories of inflation. Even, uh, and I'll even give you an interpretation of the 1980s. Let me remind you, what theories of inflation do we have? Number one, the standard theory that is taught in undergraduates, ISLM, Friedman 1968, and that pervades the policy world, is that inflation is unstable. The central doctrine, inflation is unstable if there's an interest rate peg. Uh, unstable is like the ball on top of the seal. Uh, you're, you're at any time at an interest rate peg, an inflation or deflation spiral could break out unless the central bank moves interest rates quickly, one for one, like the seal getting his nose uh, under the ball to stabilize it. Prediction, if you get a zero bound era, you're always in danger of a deflation spiral. The rational expectations view, the new Keynesians, um, they are very different fundamental doctrine. Here, interest rates, if the interest rate is pegged, inflation is stable, uh, not unstable. It's like looking forward rather than driving with your look at the rear view mirror, the car becomes stable. The problem in new Keynesian models is at a zero bound, there are multiple equilibria. So you'll get volatility, uh, sunspot volatility, if you ever hit the zero bound. They were very clear about this before the zero bound era. Central banks in this theory threaten hyperinflation to select equilibria. Uh, many of you work at a central bank, you know they don't do that, which is a central theoretical problem. When we add fiscal theory, inflation, fiscal theory picks one of these. It's just an addition to the standard New Keynesian model, repairing that fi final flaw. It picks one of those equilibria, so you have stable, and determine at a peg. There's no news about long run deficits, uh, then inflation is quiet. Well, three great theories. It's 1994. Could somebody go out and run an interest rate peg for 30 years and we could find out, are there spirals? Are there multiple equilibrium sunspots or can inflation be quiet uh, and determine it at, at a zero bound? Here's the US, 10 years of zero bound. No, no deflation spiral anywhere. And why no deflation spiral? Because if deflation breaks out, uh, the, the fiscal authorities have to raise taxes to pay a windfall to bondholders. 
Fiscal authorities are never going to do that. If you have a big deflation, no one's raising taxes to pay a windfall to bondholders. They're going to stimulus. Everybody knows that. And that's why you can't have inflation, uh, a big deflation, uh, when, uh, once it breaks up. So no deflation spiral, uh, uh, 10, 15 years of very quiet inflation. Fiscal policy wasn't great, but there wasn't a lot of fiscal news. And we had negative interest rates for uh, 10 years at a negative interest cost on the debt. Uh, all sorts of uh, uh, fiscal policy starts to look uh, starts to look good. Japan did this for 30 years. So you want an experiment. There's a central doctrinal difference in the three great theories of inflation. What happens at an interest rate peg? Uh, in the fiscal theory, it can be stable and quiet. Uh, in the under in the under theories, it's going to either spiral away or have or have uh, multiple equilibria. We really didn't know in 1994. Uh, pegs were uh, in, in 1980, but now we do. Uh, the other great theory, of course, is Milton Friedman. <clears throat> Here he is with his license plate MV equals PY. He says that the quantity of money fundamentally is what determines inflation. MV equals PY versus I put a standardized version of fiscal theory on the top right. Now, how's that different? Well, we agree. Five trillion from helicopters is inflation. That's either M plus B on the left of my equation with no S or M on the left of Friedman's equation. Uh, but here's the crucial difference. What if instead of just getting 5 trillion of money, you get 5 trillion of money, but you have to give up 5 trillion of treasury bonds? There is What if there's no wealth effect, instead just a portfolio balance effect? Well, here, monetarism says exactly the same in, uh, inflation must happen. Whereas fiscal theory, you see the M plus B enter, sim uh, enter uh, symmetrically, so there's no inflation at all. Now, theoretically, there's another problem with monetarism, as there is with the New Keynesian. It doesn't describe our central banks. Our central banks do not have off equilibrium, uh, off equilibrium inflation threats to select equilibrium, and our central banks don't set the money supply. If you don't set the money supply, this is a beautiful theory, but it doesn't apply. Friedman was very clear about this. Peg interest rates, you'll get unstable inflation. You must set the money supply. But our central banks don't set the money supply. They set interest rates. Well, how could we tell these apart? Would somebody please run an enormous experiment for us? First, send people $3 trillion of money and $2 trillion of unfunded deficit, debt to finance big deficits. Second, once you've seen how that works out, could you send people $5 trillion of money and take back Five trillion of debt, a big open market operation. Let us distinguish open market market operations from helicopter drops. Well, fortunately, our governments just did that one too. You can't ask for bigger, more decisive experiments. Let's send them five trillion bucks of money in 2021 to 2023 versus quantitative easing. Send them five trillion bucks and take back five trillion of treasuries. You know exactly what happened. Here's uh, the zero bound era in the U.S. I made this plot, again, interest rates at zero, nothing going on with inflation uh, at all. In fact, quieter than when central banks were moving interest rates around. The bottom shows you the Fed assets uh, on the right-hand side growing up to nearly 5 trillion uh, relative to about 10 billion beforehand, an atom bomb of an open market operation. What happened to inflation? Absolutely nothing. We're left to talking about 10 basis points here and there on long-term bonds if we want to talk about QE. You can't ask for a bigger experiment distinguishing, does money have a wealth effect or does it have a, a portfolio balance effect? What about the 1980s? That is always the, the, the poster child, the, the number one episode for how important is monetary policy. Three episodes of three swings of inflation. I kind of worry about 75 because boy, does that look like now. Notice uh, inflation comes down without high interest rates and then get stuck a little bit lower than it should be, and then something bad happens in the Middle East. Uh, but be that as it may, let's look at the 1980s, which is my central point here. What happened in the 1980s? You, uh, interest rates were very high, and this is just the classic experiment uh, of, of the standard policy view. To bring inflation down, you need interest rates above inflation, as we have not had yet, and a big recession, but that steadfastness brings in, brings uh, uh, inflation down. Bingo, it's all monetary policy. Wait a minute, is that all monetary policy? Um, in this period, lots of other things were happening too. 
In the, the um, this is entirely U.S., but similar things happened around the world. In the U.S., there was a big tax reform. We cut marginal rates from 70% to 28% and correspondingly broadened the base so much that revenues went up. There was a, a big social security reform. They, remember, what matters is those, outs, those deficits out into the endless future. Well, we cut those. We put social security back on a sound footing for at least 30 years. Uh, so the expected value of future deficits shot up when that happened. And of course, there was deregulation and massive economic growth. Or if, if you know, you might, I don't want to assume it was cause and effect, for one reason or another, there was massive economic growth and nothing like economic growth to pay off government debts. On the bottom left here is the primary surplus uh, scaled by the value of debt. You can see the 1970s were actually pretty darn bad. 1975, Malays, uh, Vietnam War plus Great Society. Uh, it wasn't clear that the US government was devoted to paying back its debts. Uh, starting in the 1980s, primary, uh, primary surpluses just roared back. And you know you want the present value of primary surpluses to pay back debts, boy, you've got it. Of course, the right-hand side of this graph ought to give you some concern, and I'll get back there. But it is clear that the in the 1980s, you can also see these are huge interest costs on the debt. Interest costs on the debt surged. Bondholders got paid a windfall. They bought bonds at close to 20%. They got paid off uh, when interest rates went down to, to 7%. They got paid off in money that was much more valuable than they expected. Where did that come from? Where did the interest costs on the debt and the windfall to bond payers come from? Boom, right here, out of taxes. The 1980s were a joint fiscal, monetary, and microeconomic reform. And if you look through history, all of the successful disinflations combined fiscal, uh, monetary, and microeconomic reform. The poster child, of course, being Germany. <laughs> Uh, this is from Sargent's famous Ends of Inflations. How did inflation, notice the 10 to the 15 on the y-axis. How did inflation stop? It stopped when the fiscal problem was stopped. There was no high interest rates. There was no tight money supply. In fact, budget deficits increased because people now had faith they would get paid back. There was no recession, the economy boomed. Uh, so that's the, you know, that's the poster child for it's mostly fiscal. With all this in mind, I cannot help but be a little bit worried about the future. Uh, these are the Cong Congressional Budget Office projections of where the U.S. will go. It's not a forecast. It's a projection based on current law, what's going to happen. Uh, this will not happen. Congressional Budget Office says unsustainable. We only don't know how it will get fixed, but it, it will one way or another, either higher tax revenues, lower spending, uh, could be debt crisis or inflation. Uh, one of those two, one of those will, will take place. And that leads you to a little bit of worry. In fact, I'm even more worried. This is an optimistic forecast. Notice where the debt came in the last two surges. It was financial crisis and COVID. We went down a little because we inflated it away after COVID. We've inflated away 15% of our debt. Uh, it can happen in the US like anywhere else. I don't know why bondholders are not mad as heck about this, but they seem not to be. Uh, now, of course, bondholders think the US will eventually figure out this problem. It's a self-inflicted wound. There's no barbarians at the gates of the US, at least. It's, you know, our we have not made the decision. Do we want European growth and a European wealth, European taxes, or do we want a, a reformed welfare state? Uh, that's a sent that's a decision that a democracy should be able to make. But of course, the danger is in that there will be new crises. And so what I worry about is in the next crisis, which will happen sooner than anyone expects, the US goes to markets and say, I another need another five to $10 trillion in money. Markets having been burned by inflation once will say, uh, not, the inflation will come much more quickly and the US may even be unable to borrow. So this does need to get fixed. For the moment, why are we not seeing a revolt? I think uh, bondholders are, are saying, well, that was once, we'll let you have once, we're a little bit skittish. Um, but uh, they do think that the U.S. will eventually reform as, as the rest of the Western world faces this uh, same, uh, same issue. Now, in the other last point, fiscal theory po points to severe constraints on monetary policy that were not present in the 1980s. In the 1980s, debt to GDP was 25%. And those of you who are old enough to remember, there was still big concern about debt and deficits and would those lead to too much inflation uh, despite monetary policy. Now, debt to GDP is 100% and 250 in Japan. In the US and in Europe, a 1% rise in the interest rate means a 
high of GDP, higher interest cost on the debt means 1% uh, of GDP more deficit that has to get paid for somehow. Japan, it's 2.5%. That's a big monetary fiscal interaction. 1% interest rate is not that big. 1% of GDP additional deficit is a lot. Furthermore, higher interest rates hurt banks, which have been scandalously allowed to bet on interest rates going down forever, and there, therefore means uh, governments may have to bail out banks. Financial dominance is really the same thing as fiscal dominance, because the reason you can't let the, the what you're going to do if the banks all go under is, is send them more money. The ECB has this problem in spades because higher interest rates also hurt countries of which the ECB holds a vast portfolio of their debt and has pledged to keep their interest rates down. Higher interest rates cause recessions, which mean more stimulus. So when there's fiscal pressure causing inflation, higher interest rates pour gas on that fiscal inflation. In every model we have, standard models, when interest rates rise, there's a little footnote that says fiscal policy passively, easily tightens to pay those higher interest costs, to pay the windfall to bondholders, to pay whatever bailouts and stimulus come from the recession. What happens in our world if central banks say, oh, one to 2% higher real interest rates, please, uh, please everybody uh, send us more tax, you know, raise taxes and, and uh, governments say, we can't do it or we won't do it. In every model, higher interest rates without tighter fiscal policy to pay those costs can raise rather than lower inflation. So that's all I got to say. Uh, this is an ad, of course, for a book, <laughs> a website where you'll find all these uh, other uh, 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 other essays. And I hope I've at least sparked your interest. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.